All right, can everybody hear me online? It's kind of tall. I didn't see anybody respond. Can... Hello? I hear you, David. All right, Skip hears me, so better than nothing. Okay. Yeah, I was assigned the book of Joel. Um, let me get back to that. And it's only three chapters long, but there's there's a lot in the book. Um, it was written by obviously a guy named Joel, which um, means Jehovah is God, um, and he was the son of Pethuel, who means in God. Um, and uh, it seems that he was preached. Um, we don't really know the date. Uh, we can kind of guess um, ninth century, possibly, or um, fifth or sixth century. It just depends. Um, you know, there's no kings mentioned in the book, which there's a few prophets that don't mention kings in the book, so that's not um, unique, I guess. Um, a lot of people think, a lot of scholars think it might have been during jo Joash's reign while Jehoiakim. Jehoiada, Jehoiada, I don't know how to say his name, ruled in this place. He was a high priest. He kind of ruled in this place. So he, technically there wasn't a king at that time. Um, and the Syrians or Babylonians weren't mentioned, aren't mentioned in the in this book. Um, so the Syrians and Babylonians are kind of a larger power after the ninth century, you know, fifth, sixth century or sixth, seventh century. Um, but they all but he mentions Phoenicia, Philist Philistia, Egypt, and Edom who were more prominent in the ninth century. So possibly um, Joel was preaching in the ninth century. Um, he mentions those, those uh, powers in chapter three. Um, doesn't really matter when the date is, you know, the message is still the same. Um, Joel mentions a lot of, uh, or Joel and a lot of other uh, prophets have some of the same uh, they mentioned some of the same things. So either Joel might have gathered um, information from other prophets or other prophets might have um, um, added stuff to their books um, that are the same as, as what Joel wrote. <coughs> so some of the themes of Joel. Uh, the day of the Lord is the big one. Um, it's mentioned three times. or There's three days of the Lord that the book mentions um, of past day of the Lord. Uh, in chapter one, a possible future day of the Lord. Um, in chapter two, and then chapter three would be the day of the Lord. You know, the end of time day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. Um, another theme is turning judgment into blessing uh, through repentance. Um, chapter two is big on that. Uh, we'll get into that in chapter two. And then also prom the promise of the Spirit uh, is mentioned. So it's one of the books. Um, Peter actually mentions Joel in his sermon in Acts two. So we'll get into that too. Um, yeah, so a lot of the other prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Nahum, uh, the Psalms mention Joel, Malachi, Obadiah, Micah, Amos. There's a lot of prophets that mention Joel or vice versa. Joel mentions a lot of those prophets. It just depends on when you want to date the book, I guess. And then there's a few New Testament references in Matthew 24, Acts 2, Romans 10, and then also Revelation uh, and Joel kind of helps in understanding Revelation. Um, of course, I don't understand any of that, so we're we're not going to try to get into Revelation a whole lot. So, um, any questions before I get into the outline of the book or comments? Just kind of the overview of of Joel. Anything? Okay. Uh, chapter one it talks about a previous locust invasion. Um, in verses one through four um, mentions the locust invasion. Um, but first in verse one um, said, you know, the word of the Lord that came to Joel. So this is the word of the Lord. It's important. Uh, we need to read it and understand it. Um, and verse two, he addresses the, he addresses this book to all the inhabitants of the land. Um, sometimes, some of the other prophets, you know, 
are specifically uh, mentioning a certain class or a certain uh, group, you know, Israel or Judah or um, the priests or something, but he, he mentions all, everybody in the land. Um, he does say, oh, elders, um, but that's basically just means older, older people, not a special term. And then he also mentions um, in verse three to tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons about this uh, and their sons, the next generation. So we kind of see um, there's another couple times in the Bible where this is mentioned, obviously Deuteronomy six, um, you know, hero Israel, your Lord, your God is one. Um, you know, you're supposed to tell this, teach this to your sons, to their sons and so and so, so on and so on. Also in Exodus 10, um, I guess we can go there. Exodus 10, verse 1 through 2. Um, if somebody has that, they can read it. Exodus 10, 1 and 2. Yes. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson. How I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I've done among them so that you may know that I am the Lord. So he says this to Pharaoh, um, you know, I'm going to do great things, which are obviously bad things to the Egyptians, but you need to tell your sons and grandchildren so they know not to make the same mistakes. So this is kind of the same, same thing, you know, you need to tell your, um, the generations after you um, how bad this locust plague was and, and why it was so, why, why it came. Um, so we looked at the severity, the first four kind of starts in looking at the severity of the plague. You know, there's four different, either four different types of locusts come or four different, basically locust plagues just swarm through, you know, one after the other. Um, so basically there's nothing left. Um, and later on in the chapter, it says there's not even anything left for the, the cattle, you know, to drink or eat. Um, so it's, you know, complete devastation. Um, you know, awake, uh, verse five, awake drunkards and weep, you know, there's nothing left for, for you to drink. Um, also, um, where is it? Uh, lament like, uh, in, in verses eight through 12, lament like an engaged woman who's lost, basically lost their fiance on their wedding day, you know, um, which is a terrible thing to happen. Um, you know, you've been, you've, uh, created a relationship with this person and and the day, you know basically the day of, right after you're married you know that person's taken away from you so it's very very terrible um so there's a lot of sorrow after this locust plague there's, yeah um, amos 7 refers to it um it's just the idea of you know these waves of locusts it's also there are waves of crops so there are certain times like different seasons for different crops. So having waves of locusts means they're going to get every wave of every crop. Sure. Yeah, I guess it couldn't be. It's not necessarily one plague right after the other. Maybe there was a locust plague, everything was destroyed, and then they replanted. And then there was another one that came. Before they could harvest, everything is destroyed. So this, uh, Amos 7, 1 says, this is what the Lord God showed me. He told he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's moment. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's the idea that there's, I mean, sometimes there are there are crops that just they, they come up one after another. Yeah. Um, or that you'll you'll throw the seed out and it will lie dormant until a certain time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's it's, it's not that it just came in and just like one and done. It was this wave after wave yeah. eating off all the crops they're dependent on. Yeah. Yeah. So complete destruction and there's nothing left for anybody to eat. Um, and then uh, there's an instruction um, for the people um, what they need to do because of this plague, like, uh, starting in verse 5 through verse 13. You know, it tells the drunkards to awake. Um, what's one of the, you know, what's one of the enticements of like alcohol and drugs? Uh, yeah, it relaxes you. You know, drowns your sorrows away, that kind of thing. Um, your worries and your anxieties. He's telling them to awake. Obviously, one of the reasons that they need to awake is because there's no wine left. You know, so. 
Um, make wine. Yeah, and there's nothing, there's not going to be any wine for a while because there's nothing to make wine from. Um, and then we talked about lamenting like um, somebody who lost their fiance on their wedding day. And then also gird yourselves, uh, priests, verse 13 and 14. Gird yourselves in sackcloth and lament, priests. Uh, why do you think they needed to? Why do you think they needed to do that? Their uh, their grain offerings and drink offerings were gone. For one, you know the people didn't have anything left to make offerings, and that's kind of one of the reasons that you know one of the things that the priests depended on. Um, but also, they're the leaders. You know they need to lead the people in repentance basically um rouse the people to repentance and action so um and then verse 13 through 20 um the call to mourning <coughs> um obviously the priests were to lead the people i have first peter 2 9 i don't remember what that said let's read that first peter 2 verse 9 Oh, you can read it? Uh, you can read it. Um, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah, so who are the priests of today? The church. Um, you know, when something bad happens, we're the leaders. Um, You know, the tells them, or the Lord tells them to dress in sack, which is the you know an outward sign of okay, they're in the temple, uh, thirteen and fourteen. Um, yeah, yeah, that <laughs> well put. Well said. But I guess it means the handful of people with stuff in a storehouse need to suffer and, and fast with everyone else. He well, no, and I think it says that. Uh, um, where does it in the near the end of the chapter it says uh, your food, uh, verse 16 has not food been cut off before your eyes uh, verse 17 the seeds shrivel under their clods the storehouses are desolate the barns are tore down for the grain is dried up so there, there's not even anything in the storehouses it's bad um, in the very end of chapter 1 um, we get even the beast of the verse 20 even the beast of the field pant for you Waterbird. They don't even have anything to drink. Okay. That's about that's chapter one. The outline that I have for chapter one. Um, I don't know if there's anything that uh, anybody wants to point out. Who who read jo Joel? I did not. I did not. I have, but not in <laughs> but, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm All right. So, <laughs> is, is a, is a previous day of the Lord. He talks about his massive temple of this plague. Chapter two uh, is a prophecy for a future, a future day of the Lord, not the day of the Lord, but a future day of the Lord. <laughs> so, one through eleven, vision of an army. Um, this is a prophecy of future events. Obviously, um, you know, it says uh, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm. So, it, you know, this is an imminent attack. This is something that's going to happen very soon. Um, so people need to be prepared to know what's going to happen. And then verse 2 through 11 is the attack. Uh, fierce and unstoppable foreign army will invade. Probably cause uh, fear. Uh, verse 2. Thick darkness, so there's it's it's a paint he paints a bleak picture. Fire consumes before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before, but a desolate wilderness behind them. So basically they destroy everything. And some scholars think that that he's talking about the plague of locusts again and and is likening it to an to an army. Um, some other scholars just think it's a it's a prophecy of a future day of the Lord that will happen maybe um, when the Assyrians come, you know, destroy everything, something like that. 
Um, and then let's look at nine, uh, verse seven through nine, because it it has about some of the same language. Yeah, yeah. Somebody can read that whenever they get to it. Uh, in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like mine's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. So this this kind of um, likens a locust, the locust to a real army. Um, so that's one of the reasons that some scholars think this is actually referring to maybe a future locust plague or just rehashing the original locust plague, uh, being more specific about it. Um, but there's a lot of the same imagery in that passage. Of One of the uh, images that doesn't really sound like locusts is verse seven, um, the word mentions they march in line. They don't deviate from their paths. That doesn't sound really like a locust plague um, to me, but um, in the verse. They fly. they fly in a swarm and it's yeah. incredible how yeah. unified they are. So it, it, it could yeah. be. Like Like a controlled chaos. Yeah, controlled chaos. Uh, control. uh, verse 10 uh, says, Before them the earth the heavens trim. Brightness. So this, the sun and moon going dark, stars losing the brightness. That meant, That's mentioned about three times in the book. Um, you know, that's an allusion to the coming of Christ or God, something that might happen um, soon. Uh, Matthew 24, somebody, somebody turn and hold on to Revelation 6, 12 through 14. And then somebody else turn to Matthew 24, 29 through 30. 6, 12 through 14. And then Matthew 24, 29 through 30. Somebody read that whenever they get to it. I got Matthew. Yeah. 29 through how far? 29 through 30. 29 through 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Yep. So that that's kind of an allusion to the day the day of the Lord. This chapter two is is not necessarily talking about the end of time, but it's just referring to that you know we're getting closer to it. What's what does Revelation say? Six seventeen. Uh, Revelation six twelve through fourteen. Yes. Um, and I beheld when he had opened the six seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became uh, black as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto. Uh, oh, let me turn this off. Sorry. And the stars fell to heaven unto uh, the earth, even as the fig tree casts out her. Uh, unto, I cannot see this. Untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed uh, as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. So I'm more looking into this. Uh, the, the stars, this out of the sky. Um, and then verse 11 um, talks about how the destruction is, com is uh, final and complete. Um, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great. For strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? Um, so that's kind of the end of this little section talking about um, a future day of the Lord. And um, 12 through 17, verse 12 through 17 is a call to repentance. So it's the Lord saying, you know, if you, want, if you don't want this to happen, this is what you need to do, basically. Um, 
So verse 12, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. So, you know, no matter how close God is to executing his wrath, you know, there's still time to repent. And um, I'll read a couple, we'll read a couple of verses that you pointed out in your sermon this, this morning. So verse two, so I'm going to get that. And Ezekiel 33, 10 and 11. So I'm going to get that. All right, go ahead and read. Um, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. That's right. So, you know, verse 12 says, you know, hey, return to me, um, you know, repent, follow me, you know, in this, I will relent from this disaster that I've just said will happen. Um, and then Ezekiel 33, somebody have that? Uh, 10 and 11. Uh, and you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus have you said, surely, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Yeah, so you know, basically, this the Lord says, Hey, this is what will happen because you turned away from me. but it's not something that I want to happen. You know, verse 12, you know, even now you can return. Um, and, I, and also verse 13 was my favorite verse of the whole uh, book. Uh, it says, rend your heart and not your garments. So make it an inward change, not necessarily an outward uh, outward change. And now return to the Lord your God. So, um, and then also Jonah 3 verse 9. Um, I had that written down too. Somebody have that. Jonah 3.9. Yeah, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. So um, that's the correlation there. Um, that's all about all I had for... Have you that. thought about uh, how verse 13 is Acts 2.37? Was, no, I didn't, wrote that. I didn't write that down. It says, it says, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. You notice when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Mm-hmm. And said, "Men and brethren, what shall what we should do?" What should we do? Not they what did should... not tear their garments. That's right. And generally, that was this that pharisaical response to mourning. Mm -hmm. They didn't tear their heart, uh, mm -hmm. their garments. They tore, they rent their heart. Yep, they were pierced to the heart. Um, that's right. Yeah, and I, didn't, that's I didn't get that. And so Acts two is also where he had just quoted Joel two, and it's right here. Yeah. Yeah, and when I have a reference to. I had a reference to Acts down here in the in chapter three. Yeah, there you go. Chapter two. Yeah, twenty-eight. The Pentecost of God. Yeah. Um. So that's after the verse seventeen. You know, the book of Joel kind of takes a takes a turn. Um, for a little while to talk about. Um. Uh, hold on. Let me see if I'm on the right spot here. Eighteen. Oh, no, he still talks about deliverance. It's verse 28, where he kind of takes a turn. Um, so, so in verse 18 through 21, um, there's the assurance. God promises deliverance uh, following repentance. Um, you know, it says verse 18, the Lord will be zealous for his land. How much time do I have? What do we stop? Five? It might be a little bit before five. Um, That's fine. And then the Lord's response, 18 through 27. Uh, it's verse 19. The Lord will answer and say to his people, um, and you will be satisfied and full with them. So basically, he's, uh, he's basically talking about how, you know, if you repent from, from, your uh, evil deeds um i'll return everything that happened plus you know plus from the locust plague um and that's 18 through 27. um 23 says he'll provide the early and latter rains um you know for crops uh, those are crucial in the development of the of the crops um 
verse 24, the threshing floors will be full of grain, vats will overflow with new wine and oil. So they're going to have an abundance um, from their repentance. God will make up for the years the locusts took. Verse 25, 26, um, they'll be satisfied. Pray, they'll praise God. They'll have plenty to eat, verse 26, and be satisfied. So it's just a, an image of, of having more than they need. Um, and then verse 27, uh, because of all of this, because of what the Lord's going to give to them at the very end, uh, you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other and my people will never be put to shame. So, you know, the, the abundance of, um, of physical things that the Lord will bless Israel with, you know, will be so much that they can't just say, well, we just had a good year, you know. <clears throat> they'll know that it came from the Lord because there'll be so much. And then we get to the Pentecost of God. And this is reference to Acts, or uh, Peter references this section in Acts 2, um, verse 17 through 21. Um, and this is, in this, so this, so, you know, there was a, there was a locust plague that was, that had happened uh, so that was the previous day of the Lord. And then we had a, a prophecy about a future day of the Lord. Um, and, you know, if the, I, I'm not sure if the people actually repented before this happened um, to stay kind of stave off this day of the Lord, or if it, they repented after it happened. Um, you know, it's, it's prophetic writing. I'm not sure what the intent, intent was in that aspect. Um, but then after this time um you know god's going to pour out his spirit on all mankind and we know that that happened you know in acts acts chapter two it began began to happen in acts chapter two um and that's what peter references um and i guess we can we can read um acts 2 17 through 21 is that right yeah somebody want to get that yes Acts 2, 17 through 21. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall uh, prophesy, uh, and your young men shall see visions, and your young men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesies and I will shew wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved yep so that's um, Peter quoting these uh, verses of Joel 32. And this is the second time that um, Joel alludes to uh, the, the uh, image of the sun will be dark and turned into darkness and moon into blood. Um, it doesn't actually mention the stars, but that's still kind of a, you know, a leading up to um, judgment. You know, if you only quote the first part of verse 32, um, the last part of Joel 2.32 is for in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Hmm. So it's they will call on the Lord, but the, but the Lord will call on them. And that's exactly what Acts 2 39 is. It's mm -hmm. promises to you, children, and you all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. Mm -hmm. So it defines how it's because Peter Peter left that part out so they could explain it. You know, I guess. Yep. All right. Um Chapter three uh, is is the judgment of God, and um, some scholars, um, you know, think this is obviously the 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 judgment judgment day, you know, end of the end of the world, um, and some also think, well, the ones that uh, think that it's the end of the world, you know, uh, think that that Joel's referring to Judah and Jerusalem, obviously in the spiritual sense. So we're you know spiritually we're Judah. Jerusalem, um, but there's also some other scholars 
who think this is talking about the physical Israel, you know, and how Israel is going to be um, going to be restored um, physically. Um, but we're going to go with this is the end of the end of the world because <laughs> I don't I don't believe that it's talking about the physical Israel. Um, so verse one, uh, the true Israel uh, receives forgiveness. God judges the nations or the verses verse one through seven. God judges the nations opposed to his purpose in those verses. Um, and it starts off uh, with some, with some end of time language in those days. And at that time, you know, basically means sometime in the future, you know, it's, it's, it's not a specific um, time. So it's referring to the distant future, referring to, uh, so in, uh, see, it says, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem in verse one, um, you know, it's referring to what previously, uh, for referring to days after what previously happened, restoring um, the things they lost from, from their judgments. What did I, Luke, I got Luke 4, 18. I wonder what that says. Four eighteen. Uh, so the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are repressed. Um, so that mentions some of that here. Um, I thought it did. Well, I think that I guess that's talking about the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. So the spiritual Judah and Jerusalem, you know, Christ restore is restoring that um, in in Luke, and then obviously the uh, apostles um, restore that. The church restores that. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. Uh, it talks about the Valley of Jehosh Jehoshaphat. Um, wrote down what that means. I can't find it. Oh, so it means the Lord judges or or has judged. So it's not physical. You know, there's a physical valley of Jehoshaphat. Um, this is talking about a, a figurative thing. Um, it's basically where the you know where judgment's going to happen in in these verses. Uh, it mentions time and sudden um, wickedness of these the, of those nations. Um, Amos also mentions the wickedness of those nations. Um, we won't go there. Uh, verse five through eight, it's kind of the adage of whatever you sow, you will, you will reap. Um, so it talks about Tyre and Sidon, which, you know, it kind of alludes to um, all, not necessarily just Tyre and Sidon, but a lot of nations, a lot of evil nations. Because, um, the, you know, they took, a lot of different nations took so, the, the Lord's silver and gold and brought the Lord's treasures to their temples sold the sons of Jude and Jerusalem to the Greeks or, you know, to others to remove them. And then the Lord's going to give, give, give back what, you know, what the, the wicked nations took, I guess you'd say, or turn it against them. Um, so, you know, you, you reap what you sow. And then the last uh, verse nine through 13 talks about um, basically nations gathering for battle of Armageddon and, you know, I'm not uh, smart enough to explain all this. Um, let's see. Uh, it's verse 9. There's a reference to Revelation 16, 14. Revelation 16, 14. Uh, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. So, you know, the revelation or Joel is referring to the same, same event right here. Um, preparing to meet your God. So verse 10 through 13 
is basically an allusion to preparing um, to meet to meet God at the end. You know, um, beat your you know this is all um, figurative language, I guess you'd say. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. So you know, basically get ready, um, hasten to come. The surrounding nations, verse eleven. Gather yourselves there. Let the nations be aroused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, it's funny. I don't remember where in Isaiah it mentions, but Isaiah actually mentions the opposite of what verse 10 says. Um, you know, turn your swords into plowshares, like the opposite. Um, but this is the end of time, so there's no need for there's no need for those implements anymore. Um, and then you know, it talks about the Valley of Jehoshaphat again. Obviously, we, we talked about the Lord judges. It means the Lord judges or has judged. And then verse 14 through 17 um, talks about the reign of Christ. Well, I had one more page of notes, not a whole page, at the very end of the section. Um, I guess we'll wing it. Um, verse 13 and 14, um, where does it say, uh, somebody turn to Revelation 14, uh, verse 14 through 20, and somebody get Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and verse 39. Yes, 14, 14 through 20, and then Matthew 13, uh, 24 through 30, and verse 39. All right, Revelation 14. Okay. Uh, you want to read it? Dave, you want to read it? No, you can read it. Okay. Uh, then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and, uh, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is, very, is, is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he, he too had a sharp sickle. And a, another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he, he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So, so the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as horses and the horses bridle for 1600 stadia. So this is an allusion to the angels doing the harvesting, you know, at the end of time, um, um, harvesting, you know, the good and the evil. Um, verse 13, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Um, come tread for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for the wickedness and great. So, you know, it's time, it's time to, um, where we'll see in Matthew 13, um, we'll go ahead and read that and we'll talk about it. 4 through 30 and 39. Yeah. Uh, he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seed, sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, do you, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then do they have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest the gathering in the weed, lest the get lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, verse thirty nine. Verse thirty nine, yeah. Uh, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So, you know, basically um farmer plants wheat in the fields but somebody sows in you know weeds and they can't just pick up the weeds take the weeds out or it'll uproot um the wheat you know the wheat is the righteous the weeds are are the evil and this verse 13 you know is referring to 
you know, basically the, the harvest of, of the good and the bad people at the end of time. Um, any thoughts on that? It's uh, most of those way over my head. Like I don't have enough uh, brain power to dig into that. Um, but it's interesting. And then another, another allusion to the sun darkening, verse 15, stars lose their brightness. That's the third time they mentioned that. Um, you know, it basically refers to the judgment of the final day, uh, the final day. Uh, verse 16, the Lord shakes heaven and earth. Um, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth tremble. The Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. And I had Hebrews 12, 26 or 28 for that. I think it's another allusion to the earth shaking. 26 or 28. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression yet once more denotes the removing of these things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. So this is referring to the, the shaking of the earth, basically, to remove those things that can be shaken. Um, and then the end, you know, the last part of the, of the chapter 3, 18 through 21, talks about, um, you know, basically, the uh, after the after the judgment what what comes next after the judgment their blessing um, and renewal um spiritual zion and it, and it mentions verse 17 it mentions dwelling in zion my holy mountain you know this is obviously not physical but spiritual and then i don't don't have my notes for the last little section there but um basically it refers to um what's going to happen to the righteous you know after the after the uh, end of the world, um, verse 18, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, the hills will flow with milk, all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, you know, it, everything's going to be renewed, it's going to be awesome and great, and and uh, um, even the valley of Shittim, um, there's going to be water in the valley of Shittim, apparently that was a dry place, you know, that nothing grew, and so there's even going to be a renewal in that area and then you know the egypt and edom talking about the wicked nations they'll become desolate a waste um because of what they did and their violence against judah <coughs> um, judah will be inhabited forever you know this is a as a spiritual judah and also a spiritual jerusalem um and then the very the very last line you know for the lord dwells in zion you know god's going to be with us in heaven so that's basically the book of joel hey, about verse 19 though it says, egypt shall become a desolation mm -hmm. uh, edom a desolate wilderness it's, it's interesting egypt had the fertile crescent it was mm -hmm. known for its you know lush crops that it could produce yeah. but in judgment what was known as lush is going to be a wasteland Mm -hmm. what um and judah is going to be experiencing the the lush um you know fruit yeah the, the harvest so it's um it's like split yeah yeah it's a uh, um, joel's a good it was a good book um and to me to me reading it reading through it, you know 10 15 times for me to start to understand what the, um but it, there's a lot in it you know, basic uh, main theme is the day of the Lord. You know, looking at three different days of the Lord. Um, so that's all I had. Anybody have any closing comments? I just uh, like um, I just realized like there's a lot of like spiritual talking in this, but from what I've talked to like most people who practice Jewish faith, they they kind of look at it sometimes as a, as a literal thing. So mm. it's kind of weird how you can kind of, when you're reading this, you kind of see the spiritual talking, but then when you talk to someone of the prior faith, they keep it as a physical. I wonder why that yeah. is the case. Cause yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know 
why some, you know, especially chapter three, why some think it's a physical, you know, Israel is going to be restored physically. Um, and I guess there's a lot, I guess that's why there's, you know, a lot of people that get mad when we don't support Israel, you know, as far as politically and whatnot. Why do people think that Jesus returning is going to be a physical thing? That's true. They wanted restoration. That's true. And that's it's still, true. still happening today. People are still thinking that. It's still happening yeah. today. Because it didn't, it wasn't restored then, so it's got to be restored now. People yeah. are still looking for a physical thing. And, you know, I don't know if this is the only chapter in the Bible that, that people think this is what it's talking about. But I know that okay. in my research, there's a, there's a lot of people. Um, so. So I think to close it up, this is the last, last class for this series, right? Yeah. This is the, this is the last so class. I, so I just kind of wanted to mention uh, what your, uh, you said was your favorite verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 13, uh, enter in your hearts, not your garments, return to the Lord your God. I think it's just like, I know we already all know this uh, as Christians growing up in the church, but uh, it's just crazy when people say that they've gone too far. Uh, mm -hmm. like they can't there's no way that they can come back uh, I think it's just crazy when you hear that kind of stuff when you read like pretty much all the prophets all the minor prophets that we read every single time uh, the Lord was always like he's patient he's going to be there oh, yeah. if you ever want to come back to him so I just think that's just uh, it's a very simple message but it's very powerful and it's so, yeah that's true yeah. and yeah he's, he's changed his mind um, you know the, it, I think it talks about in Jonah where the Lord changed his mind, you know, and, and we, and obviously the God doesn't change His will doesn't change, but because, because they repented, then he didn't need to bring about destruction anymore, you know, because they were following, uh, following the law again. Well, this morning's lesson had the same, same connotation. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and, and I, why didn't you mention Joel in your, <laughs> Sorry for this point. All the time I've had left in the Go ahead, Dave. He didn't come. It's it wasn't the, how do you phrase it? Not the the healthy, but the sick that need a physician or something yeah. to that effect. Um, but in a lot of these minor prophets, we see when God is, is calling the people and when he's wanting them to return, they're not just a little sick. I mean, they're at rock bottom disgracing the you know, committing sins that even the, the pagan tribes weren't doing, like just really, really, um, you know, living in, in wickedness and, and just uh, not, no shame, just, you know, yeah. uh, li living out every, every wicked thing that you could imagine. And that's the time when God is sending these prophets saying, return to me. I still want you. I want to give you the blessings I promised you. I don't want to have to do all these terrible things. I don't want to continue sending you away to captivity. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, read, I read two books out of a series. I don't remember who wrote it, but it was about King Hezekiah, you know, his life, you know, and it's a, it's, it's fiction, but they take, um, they take all of their content from the prophets and, you know, Kings and um, when it talks about Hezekiah, but you know, there's a, there's a scene in the book where, you know, Hezekiah's, young um king ahaz is his father and uh there's he's in his in his room a nursery or whatever i think he's only a few years old but you know based uh, all of a sudden you know uh guards come in take them all out take all of the kid all of the children out you know to uh this this uh altar this idol you know and it's flames coming out of his mouth talking about uh what's the asheroth molek molek you know, and basically didn't have enough time to think about what was happening. He was really scared. He's only a few years old. And then all of a sudden his older brother gets thrown into the mouth of that fire and he's gone, you know? Yeah. I don't remember what it was called. It was good. It was a good book. Cause it really, yeah. Yeah. Um, cause it really opened your eyes to, to what could have been happening, you know, in, in that time frame. Um, so it's really good. And then, and then it happens again, you know, a couple of weeks later because the Assyrians are coming to, uh, to take over Judah, you know? Um, and so Ahaz wants all of the officials to sacrifice their oldest son to Molech so that, you know, Molech will help instead of turning to, to, uh, the Lord. And then, 
you know, it has Isaiah in there, and Isaiah prophesies to Hezekiah that says, "The Lord's, um, the Lord's kept you, the Lord's uh, redeemed you." I think is what it says. And the uh, the captain of the guard takes his younger brother instead um, for for some reason. I think it's I think it's because he liked Hezekiah's mom mother you know before she was married so that that's kind of the the way they get around that so it's a pretty interesting it's a pretty interesting book so that's all i had yep